Hey folks, today we have a complete in-depth review of the new Garmin Enduro 2 watch, as well as 13 things to know about it. Now I've been putting it through its paces over the course of summer, but in particular over the past week around this giant ass mountain range on the 170 kilometer, 30,000 foot elevation gain Tour de Mont Blanc. All with the aim of doing it on a single Garmin Enduro 2 battery. But we'll get into more details on that in just a second. Note that I've added YouTube tap results on the bottom so you can skip ahead to the section you find most interesting. And also note this video is definitely not sponsored. I'm gonna tell you both the good and the bad of the Enduro 2. Now first up on the list before we get to those 13 new things is the price. It is 1,099 US dollars or 1,099 euros, which is basically $100 more than the existing Phoenix 7X Solar Sapphire. In other words, the high-end biggest Phoenix version they have. This one simply costs 100 bucks more, but it does include an extra strap, so you get both a nylon strap as well as a silicone strap and all the new features and battery stuff that we'll talk about in just a sec. So first up on the list is the Enduro 2 is now a Phoenix 7X Plus. And that's important because in the past, a year and a half ago, when Garmin released the original Enduro watch, it was basically a Phoenix 6 Minus, meaning missing a ton of important features like maps and music and all these things that people actually wanted. But that's all now fixed, and they've taken basically the Phoenix 7X and added more stuff to it to give you the Enduro 2 watch. That means the Enduro 2 has maps for the region you bought it in, and you can download for free maps for any other region you travel to. These are topo active maps, which means they have not only the topography data, but also the heat map data, the trails, the roads, the streets, monuments, buildings, all that kind of stuff is on there. So you can route to anything and see things like the trail names, etc. as you go along. Now I won't rehash every brand new feature of the Phoenix 7. There are so many features that are new there compared to not just the Phoenix 6, but the Enduro 1 series. But the answer to whether or not a feature is in the Enduro 2 compared to the Phoenix 7 is always going to be yes. It's basically just an umbrella over the Phoenix 7 in terms of features. And to be clear, the Enduro 2 has solar, which gives it that little extra battery life as well. Speaking of which, that's our next one. One of the big features of the Enduro 2 is the extended battery life. I'm going to throw on the screen right now a comparison chart between the Enduro 2 and the Phoenix 7X series, Phoenix 7X Solar, whatever you want to call it, so you can kind of see those differences side by side. But of course, in my case, I was not content with just looking at a battery chart. I wanted to push it to the limits, push it to its absolute maximum, thus at my 170 kilometer journey. Now, the Tour de Mont Blanc is something that's typically done in about 10 to 11 days, 10 to 11 stages. But in my case, I aim to do it solo camping in seven nights and eight days, and with basically all the features turned on. I wasn't going to baby this in any way shape or form. So to begin, I left on what's called Sat IQ, which we'll talk about in just a second. Basically, it means it changes the GPS power to get as much accuracy as possible depending on the conditions. Next, I left on the optical heart rate on the unit, so no like heart rate straps to reduce the battery or anything like that. I added navigation, so I had a course loaded for the entire route and had navigation going the entire time. Another battery drainer. I had Climb Pro enabled, so I could see the climbs coming up. In other words, all the features were enabled. The only thing I disabled was my phone connectivity because there wasn't cell coverage anyways most of those places and it just would have burned battery for the sake of burning battery. Now when all is said and done, I completed the circuit in 58 hours and 44 minutes, which left me with 2% battery remaining, uh, and in particular less than two hours of GPS battery. Now what's important to remember is a couple things on that. Uh, number one, within that time frame, it said I had about 44 hours of actual moving time. And that's because if I stopped at a refuge for lunch or something like that, I usually didn't pause the GPS activity because I was afraid I forgot to start again when I'm back outside. Uh, and so in that case, it's gonna burn more battery sitting inside a refuge than it would outside with you know clear signal and stuff like that. The second thing to remember is that Garmin's GPS time estimates are based on the assumption that you press start and just keep on going. In other words, like the UTMB trail race where you're gonna press start at the start line and then press end when you're done at the very end. It doesn't account for sleeping and that smartwatch time each night. So if I look at the battery drain, each night it drained between one and 3% of the battery just between the time I press stop at the end of the day and the next morning when I woke up and started my hike again. Now finally, what's super fascinating about this data is you can actually see the difference in the conditions of the terrain on the battery life. So on the days where I was higher on the ridge lines where there's no trees or kind of cliffs to block it, the battery drained slowly. Versus days where I was kind of like in deep canyons and up against rock faces with deep trees and all this stuff, the battery drained much faster. And that's because of the Sat IQ GPS setting that I chose that adds power to the GPS chipset to get better accuracy in more dense treed environments and then reduces power when it doesn't need it if I'm on like a giant meadow or something like that. Now we've got a video coming up on that entire trip, all the epicness and the awesomeness and everything in between. So if you're not subscribed, hit subscribe now so you don't miss out on that. Or if you're finding this video interesting or useful, please do hit that like button. It really does help out this video and the channel quite a bit. So the next new feature is Next Fork. This is the new mapping related feature that basically shows you the distance until the next trail junction or trail fork or street junction. It does not require a course be loaded at all. It can work at any point in time as long as you're in a pedestrian activity like running or trail running or hiking or walking, anything but basically cycling. 
and it'll show you on the map the distance until the next trail junction. In the cases where it knows the name of the trail coming up, it'll show that. The same goes for streets. Otherwise, it'll just simply say the next junction is an X distance. The reason this feature is useful is there are plenty of cases, both in like backcountry as well as just simply like regional parks and things like that, where trails might get overgrown and they might not be well marked or marked at all. And you may not even realize that you've gone off onto the wrong trail. Now, obviously, if you have a course loaded, it'll eventually give you an off course warning a short distance later, but you might not have a course loaded and this simply helps prevent against that. Next up there is Sat IQ, or otherwise known as Auto Select. This is the feature that automatically goes ahead and changes the GPS settings, or rather the GNSS settings, based on the conditions you're in. So in other words, if you're in like a treed canyon up against rock cliffs, it's going to go to dual frequency or multi-band GPS mode, giving that GPS chipset all the power and ability in the world, but it's going to burn way more battery doing that. But it will be the most accurate possible mode. Meanwhile, if you're on top of a ridge line with wide open skies or out in a field, it's going to go down to GPS only mode, which means it reduces the power needed for the GPS chipset to maintain that same high level of accuracy, but without the battery burn. Now, this is something that Garmin launched in public beta on the Phoenix 7 earlier this summer, but the dirty secret is that was all a little bit of a ruse. That was a way for Garmin to do public beta testing on the SATIQ feature before officially launching it as a marquee feature of the Endura 2. Don't worry, of course, the Phoenix 7 gets to keep that feature, as does the 4955 as well, coming up in beta. I've mostly converted to using it as my standard mode for GNSS configuration, and so far I'm super happy with the results both out here as well as just in my like day-to-day -day running and cycling or whatever life. Next up, the Enduro 2 has a new flashlight. Uh, now, the Phoenix 7X was the first Garmin watch to launch a flashlight built into the front of it. What it allows you to do is to have different flashlight modes, different brightness levels, as well as both a red light and a white light. Now, it's one of those things that sounds gimmicky at first until you actually use it and you're like, I wish this was on every single watch. It's just super practical in the middle of the light to be able to double tap the upper left hand button, turn on the flashlight on a very low mode or even just a red light mode to get around in your house or whatever the case is without having to turn on the lights. The key difference though is it's now quite a bit brighter, up to two times brighter. And the way Garmin's done that is they've removed a little bit of frosting from the face of the Enduro 2 flashlight. Now since we're talking about the Phoenix 7X and the Enduro 2, now's a good time to talk about the size comparisons. Here's a lineup of the Phoenix 7 series from the 7S, the 7S, the 7X, and then the Enduro 2. The Enduro 2 is just a tiny smidge thicker than the Phoenix 7X to accommodate that bigger battery. But from the top down perspective, it's identical in terms of visual size, the width, the screen size, the solar strip, all of that stuff is the same. Next, the Enduro 2 carries with it almost all of the brand new 4955 features that launched on the, well, 4955 about two months ago. These are features that Garmin's been putting into the public beta for the Phoenix 7 series over the past two months, but today they're all launching as production on both the Phoenix 7 series as well as the Enduro 2 watch. These are largely a slate of training load and recovery features, including training status 2.0, which aims to do a better job of kind of judging your training load as well as how you should recover. And in particular within that, training readiness. So training readiness is a feature that has multiple components, including sleep, your heart rate variability, your sleep history, your stress history, uh, your recovery times, as well as your acute load or training load over the last seven to 30 days. And then based on all that, it gives you kind of a readiness level each morning on whether or not you're ready to train hard or just need more recovery. This is substantially different than something like the training status that you probably had on past Garmin watches that gave you the unproductive or productive. Uh, this is basically an umbrella above that that tries to account for more of the day-to-day -day life stuff as well as the ability to account for like a big training block. And a big piece of that is the HRV status or the heart rate variability status. This is something that takes 19 days to populate that initial data set and then it compares it against a range up to 90 days of your historical data. Heart rate variability is a way to kind of figure out how your body is reacting to stressors. That can be things like workouts, just as much as it can be sleep or stress or work or life, even drugs and alcohol will impact these numbers quite a bit. Keep in mind, HRV is more about like long-term trending than it is waking up that day and going, ah, I should absolutely do this based on this number last night. I would look at it more holistically over the course of multiple weeks. With these 4955 features, you also get native or pseudo-native running power support, which means as long as you have one of the supported Garmin running power accessories like an HRM Pro or HRM Try or HRM Run or the RD Pod, then you'll get running power natively in the watch, including the ability to do structured running power workouts. However, one feature that is not available on the Enduro 2 at launch is the 
the morning report. That is something that launched on the 955 and isn't quite yet on the Phoenix 7 or the Enduro 2 Series. Garmin says that it's absolutely coming, likely in the next big firmware update or next big feature firmware update, but it's not yet here today. It's actually one of my favorite features of the 955 and I look forward to seeing it on the Enduro 2 as well. Next up, we got two new features that are totally brand new on the Enduro 2, not seen any before before on a Garmin watch. The first is gap or grade adjusted pace. This is basically just a data field for running that shows the adjusted pace based on the terrain. Gap or grade adjusted pace is something that allows you to compare efforts on a flat course to a hilly course. Essentially adjust your pace for the grade as the name kind of implies. So this allows you to better analyze as well as manage your efforts so that you can make basically the effort the same on a flat 10K as a hilly 10K or whatever distance you want. It doesn't have to be 10K of course. It's something that if you've been using platforms like Training Peaks or others, you've probably had access to or seen for many years. The next item that's new is the auto rest timer. Now when the original Endura watch, they included a rest Rest timer. That was something that if you were doing like a trail race or an ultra race and you came into an aid station, you could tap a button and it would basically track that time as rest time until you left the aid station and we pressed the button again and you went back into the running mode. It never stopped the overall recording of the activity. It basically just kind of made this like subset of data within that that showed your rest time compared to the running time. In the case of the auto rest timer, it does the exact same thing except just automatically. So this means that you come into an aid station and stop running, it'll trigger that auto rest timer, and then as you depart, it'll go ahead and resume back in activity. The good news here is again, it's not impacting the recording, which is going on the entire time. It just slices up that time visually on the watch itself as well as on Garmin Connect, so you can separate it quickly, rest time from your running time. Next is something that may sound a little silly, but I feel like it has to be mentioned because I've been begging for it for years and mind-bogglingly has not been there for years which is that now when you have a course or route loaded, you'll see chevrons or arrows for the direction of travel of where you should be going on that course. That's a particular super useful for the courses that crisscross or like a figure eight or do a lollipop. Certainly you can wait for it to tell you to go off course or you could try to figure it out from the compass heading, but this is just much easier to be able to look at the map and go, ah, I see the arrows go this way, I'm going that way as well. Okay, now before we get into the accuracy section, talking about GPS and heart rate and elevation, as well as like my wrap up, let's talk about like more broadly how this watch did. And ultimately, I'm pretty happy with the performance of this watch. Uh, over the course of the summer, as well as over the course of the past week out here putting it to the test, it did pretty darn well. It did pretty much everything I would expect from a Phoenix 7X series with just a little bit more. Still, there was a few little things where it didn't quite stick the landing. The first one is a bit of slowness or lagginess on the map page during this long hike, starting around day four or five. And in particular, it was showing the route on the map page itself. The map page generally like showed up relatively quickly in most cases, but once it tried to load the actual route on there, you can see that like three to five second delay. This delay did not at all happen at the start of my journey. You can see right here, just me showing it loading up with an activity that's only a minute or two long, but really started to rear its head around day like four and five and continued on to the rest of the trek. So this seems to be something that's related not to the route length, but related to the activity length, meaning once my activity was 30 or so hours long, this started popping up versus that route, even though it was a 170 kilometer route, loaded instantly and showed that route instantly on day zero, but not on day four and five. Hopefully that's something that Garmin can address though with a software update down the road. Next is something that's actually more hardware than it is software, uh, which is the tiny little Garmin logo on the strap there that's actually glued on onto the strap. Uh, it started to peel off over the past week or so, ultimately falling off entirely on my last day here on the hike. Uh, now, obviously Garmin will replace this under warranty, and it's something, this is the same strap that's been used on the Enduro One, and people generally haven't had any problems with it. So this could just be like a one-off bad strap, but I figured it was important to mention it. And in some cases, people may actually prefer not having the Garmin logo on there. So I guess maybe some of you might consider that a feature. But what's not a feature is this last item, which is that the training status side of things completely fell apart on the Enduro 2 and probably would as well on the Phoenix 7 when it came to having a multi-day activity over the course of a week plus time frame. In other words, when I finished my hike yesterday and saved that activity, it basically assigned it to my start date, which was eight days ago. And that by itself, I can understand why they do te technically. The the problem is it also signed the training load to that start date as well, and then zeroed out the load for the last eight days. So when I woke up this morning, my training load was a laughable 13. Like, 
I think you get 13 by just walking to the bathroom and back or something like that. It was basically zero across the board compared to the 4955, which showed over a thousand. And that's because I save that activity every single day versus the Antura 2, I let it continue for one giant activity. Now get that some people will say that was an edge case. And I would agree with you, if not for the fact that the Enduro 2's entire purpose in life is to be an edge case. It's to have that little bit extra bit of battery to do these multi-day treks. It is targeted from an advertising, a marketing standpoint, at the endurance athlete doing multi-day treks. And the fact that it can't actually properly assign the training load that you have to the day that you did it on is definitely a bit of a problem. Hopefully though it's something they can fix because right now after completing like the trek of a lifetime, it's telling me I'm pretty much like the laziest dude on earth. Now the good news though is that does not extend into things like accuracy of heart rate and elevation GPS. And so with that, let's jump to the computer and take a closer look at those areas. Okay, so for all these data sets, we're gonna go through them a little bit quick, but I've got them all linked down below so you can dive into them much more detail there yourself. This first one is this like loops trail run I did over and over and over and over and over again. And you can see the routes are exactly the same every single time, despite being auto select. Here is a hike I did compared against the 955. In that case, that was a multi-band configuration versus the Enduro 2 is an auto select. And the actual tracks are identical, even the deepest of wood sections. Here we are up on the Tour de Mont Blanc, and you can see that the tracks between all these watches are very, very close. But there are cases where the Vertex 2 just kind of goes off the rails a little bit, just sort of skips over some of these switchbacks, like right here, where it's like, I'm just going straight across the river and ignoring the actual trail I went on. Though for the most part, it was pretty good. But even here, you can see some little wiggles with the Vertex 2 that are not there on the other units. When it comes to the elevation accuracy, I compared it against the signs throughout my journey, and it was always within a few meters, even right here, where it was reporting 1531 versus the 15. 1527 on the signpost. For the optical heart rate in terms of workout usage, pretty much exactly what I saw on the Phoenix 7 series. Uh, so you can see a little bit of latency here and there, but overall pretty good for running and mostly cycling. And again, I know this is super fast, but all this stuff is in my full written review link down below where you can dive into all the data sets in the raw formats. Okay, so let's wrap up by just quickly talking about how the Enduro 2 compares to some of the other options out there. Obviously, it's the most expensive option out there uh, in this category. In terms of being 1100 bucks, it's 100 bucks more than the Phoenix 7X Solar Sapphire, though it does include the extra straps. They're basically talking like an extra $40 for the extra battery, which still makes it twice as much as the Coros Vertex 2. But of course, the Coros Vertex 2 has basically a fraction of the features of the Garmin Phoenix 7 or the Enduro 2 series, especially in the mapping and navigation realm. And in particular, one of the features I found most useful out here is Climb Pro. It is, as I've said many times before, one of my favorite Garmin features because it shows me how much pain and suffering I have left the top of every single climb automatically, breaking up that climb and showing me the gradient over it, the remaining gradient, the remaining distance, uh, my sense rate, and so on. It is incredibly useful, not just for the ascents, but also for the descents on a course like this. But if you don't care about any of those extra features or any of the polish that you typically find on the Garmin platform, then the Vertex 2 is a very capable GPS watch, but again, for half the price. And an in Conversely, of course, if you don't need the extra battery life, there's a slew of different Phoenix 7 options that are far cheaper than the high-end 7X Solar Sapphire, or even the 4955 at 500 bucks that's even cheaper than the Vertex 2 that has pretty solid battery life, which is probably a pretty good time to just leave the whole comparison conversation for another video down the road. Ultimately, with my time on the Enduro 2, I've been pretty happy with performance. It successfully got me around this entire gigantic mountain range on a single battery life. So with that, hopefully you found this video interesting or useful. If so, whack that like button at the bottom there, or hit subscribe for plenty more sports technology goodness, including the video on the entire Tour de Mont Blanc, which should be pretty epic. Have a good one.